So they are out having a good time relaxing, I guess. They're also going to say hi to our old friend Rosemary Ruska as she departed here and went to live out there. So they're going to stop by and say hi to her too, so we'll hear greetings from her later on too, probably. Today in his place we have with us um, an esteemed speaker, David Upchurch. Uh, David has spent several years um, on staff at uh, Lincoln Christian University. And with the closing of Lincoln Christian University, David went to work as a church relations officer with Ozark Christian College, who is now partnering closely with the Lincoln uh, folks too. So to introduce you real quickly, we're gonna show you a quick video about Ozark Christian College. If Jesus has a favorite word, it might be the word go. We live in a world filled with broken people, but the good news is that Jesus came to save us, to conquer sin and death, to usher in new life. That's good news for every person on the planet. But as someone said, the gospel isn't good news if it doesn't get there in time. So Jesus says, go, go and preach, go and tell, go and make disciples of all nations. You can't spell the word gospel without the letters G-O. And that's why at the heart of Ozark Christian College is that word, go. Since 1942, we have been a great commission college, training men and women to go with the good news of Christ. How do we train them? Two ways. First, we fill them with God's word. Our Bible college accreditors mandate 30 hours of Bible classes, but we require 50 hours because we want our students saturated in scripture. We fill them with God's word, and second, we focus them on God's work. Ozark is one of the seven largest Christian church colleges, and at the other six, less than 50% graduate with a Bible or ministry degree. But at Ozark, 100% of our graduates walk out with a Bible or ministry major. Now, we are grateful for our sister schools and we need them, but what makes Ozark unique is our focus on Great Commission work. The majority of our graduates go into some kind of ministry and they have now taken the gospel to all 50 states and over 100 countries around the world. At the heart of Ozark is that word go. What am I ready to go do? What am I ready to go do? What am I ready to go do? I'm ready to go join a worship residency. I'm ready to go be a church planter. I'm ready to go do student ministry in Colorado. I'm ready to go raise a Christ-centered family. I'm ready to go connect children and their families to Jesus. Estoy lista para ir y enseñar música. I'm ready to go into church production ministry. I'm ready to go spread the gospel by writing Christian books. I'm ready to go plant churches in urban Japan. I'm ready to go plant churches and reach youth for Christ. I'm ready to go disciple those with special needs. I'm ready to go preach the gospel. I'm ready to go preach the gospel. Wherever Ozark students go, the gospel is preached. Churches are planted, scriptures are translated, children are taught, marriages are mended, addictions are broken, souls are saved, lives are changed, the nations are reached with the good news of Jesus Christ. And we do wanna say thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your financial partnership as together we get students ready to go with the gospel into all the world. Well, good morning. It is good to be with you, but it's a better morning than that. Let's try to again. Good morning. Okay. I, I, I don't know if I've shared this here before. I, I've been here several times, but when I'm in a good mood, I don't preach quite as long. And when I'm not in a good mood, I go on and on and on. And, and so to know that you're with me at the beginning here and you're excited about being here, that puts me in a good mood. So maybe I should have said that before. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's going to be a short one. And if you believe that, you've never heard a preacher say it's going to be a short one. Hey, I... Uh, Last time I was here, I, I don't think this had happened yet, but, but I, I know I'm getting older. Uh, I'm reminded of that on a regular basis. Uh, a couple of ways I know that for sure is I've got a Medicare card in my billfold, and half my stories begin with back in my day. And so I, I know I'm getting up there. But one of the things I always love when I come here to the Hill is all the, all the kids, all the teenagers and um, grade school, early childhood, the twins that just got born. Uh, I'm excited about that because a lot of churches don't have youth. And so keep doing what you're doing. When I used to preach at Rochester, Illinois, we had a bunch of babies being born. And we came up with a church growth plan that I'd like to share with you. It's not difficult. It goes like this. Have one or invite one. You make the choice, okay? The church can grow. 
Yeah, I've had the opportunity to speak in Prescott, Arizona the last several years. I've got a buddy who, who is out there, so he invites me to come out about once a year. And usually my wife will go with me. I went out Labor Day weekend. She tested positive for COVID the day before we were supposed to fly out, so she didn't get to go. But when, when she's been there, we've done sightseeing. And we'll fly into Phoenix, and we'll get driving up north uh, toward Prescott. Uh, Sedona's up there. But there, there's this unique thing that you don't see in Illinois. Uh, we're driving up, and it'll, every time there's another 1,000 feet above sea level, sign, it'll have a sign like 3,500 feet above, 4,500 feet above, 5,500 feet above. And that just blows me away because I think we're below sea level in, in Illinois. I mean, we are flat as a pancake. And, and we'll go up, and there'll be mountains, and, and we'll see mountains. We'll go around a curve. It'll be red rock, and then go around another curve with white rock. And then you look down in the valleys. And, and again, we don't have valleys in Illinois. We, we have ditches, but we, we don't have valleys. And it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. We went to the Grand Canyon a couple of years ago, and we, we saw the biggest valley I've ever seen in my life. And I love going out there. Now, I, I just said a few moments ago that in Illinois, we don't have valleys. But that's not really true, is it? We don't have the valleys that come with having a big mountain right beside it, but we have valleys. Uh, we have valleys of discouragement. Valleys of despair, valleys of depression. The valley of a doctor saying those words, it, it's cancer. The valley of a boss saying, your job is being cut. The valley of a spouse saying, I don't want to be married any longer. The valley of a cemetery when you say goodbye to a spouse or a parent or a child or a friend. The valley a few years ago of, of that thing called covid when we were inconvenienced and isolated. And I, I want to share something with you that I think you already know, but life can be hard. You know that, don't you? Life can be hard. But here's what I hope you know as well. God is good. Amen? God is good. And with every valley that we go through, we need to understand that we're not alone. Psalm 23 tells us that God is our shepherd. He is always with us, and he leads us, and he protects us, and he walks with us in and through those valleys. I love the 23rd Psalm, and we're going to walk through the 23rd Psalm today. And, and here's my, 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 my fear. When we think about the 23rd Psalm, I, I think it's easy to say that, well, this is a psalm for nursing homes. This is a psalm for hospitals. This is a psalm that you read at a cemetery it's a psalm about death, but that isn't accurate. It is a, a psalm about life. It, it is a psalm about hope. It is a psalm that, that God is with us, and he walks with us through those valleys. So let's walk through this psalm together today. And, and I shared first service. I, I grew up in an era where the King James Version was what we used most of the time. And I've had this Psalm 23 memorized in the King James for probably almost 55 years or more. And every once in a while, even though I'm going to use the NIV, the King James comes out. And so that, that may happen. I don't know. But let, let's read this. The Lord is my shepherd. I like nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Life is a mixture. We, we get a little bit of everything. We don't just get one thing. We get a little bit of everything. We, we get this mixture of pain and pleasure, a mixture of highs and lows, a mixture of success and failures, and a mixture of mountaintops and valleys. And in verse 4, David writes, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. We all have valleys that we encounter. We all have valleys that we walk through. And so I'd like for us to just consider a few life lessons about these valleys so that we can understand them. And then we'll go on to look at what we do when we're in the valleys. Here's five things. First, valleys are a part of life. 
Valleys are a part of life. They're, they're going to happen. You're going to have valleys. I'm going to have valleys. And, you know, sometimes when something goes wrong in our lives, it, it seems like we, we say, well, why is this happening to me? Like we didn't ever expect that something bad could happen or that, that, that a valley could be in our future. But valleys are going to happen. They're going to happen to all of us. I, I read this. Someone wrote, valleys work this way. You are right now, you are either coming out of a valley or you are in a valley, or you're heading into a valley. Don't you feel encouraged? Aren't, aren't you glad that, that you came today to, to hear that good news? But that, that's the truth. Most of us have had mountaintop experiences. We've had good times. But we need to understand that with every mountain, just like when you see a physical mountain, there's always a valley beside it. And we're not going to stay on the mountaintop forever. So when things go wrong, instead of stopping and, and throwing that pity party and wringing our hands and asking, why is this happening to me? We, we need to keep going and understand that valleys are a normal part of life. They're going to happen. And, and when you think about it, you know, mountaintops are wonderful, aren't they? They're, they're nice places to visit, but you don't live on the mountaintops. Real life takes place in the valley. The valleys are going to happen. Here's the second truth. Valleys are never convenient. You can't plan them. You can't find a good time to put them on their calendar when there's a, a more convenient time. How many of you get your calendar out and say, let me see, I think a week from Thursday I can schedule a valley. It doesn't work that way, does it? Most time, valleys come like this, and they come at very inconvenient times. Has your car ever broken down at a convenient time? Have you ever had a flat tire at a convenient time? Have you ever gotten sick at a really good time? Have you ever lost a job when you've had 10 years of, of savings built up so that you can live comfortable, comfortably for the next 10 years? Is there ever a, a great time for our kids to make a bad decision? Has the phone call with devastating news ever come at a good time? Usually, valleys have a way of appearing out of nowhere and at the worst possible time. A good day can become a bad day with one phone call, with one piece of mail, with one doctor's visit, with one freak accident. Valleys just happen. Here's the next truth. Valleys are impartial. No one is isolated from tough times. No one gets a free pass because bad things are going to happen to everyone. Bad, bad things are going to happen to, to good people, and bad things are going to happen to not so good people. You're going to have trials. I'm going to have trials. You're going to have difficulties. I'm going to have difficulties. You're going to have down times. Valleys are impartial. The Bible teaches that in this life we will all have problems. Jesus taught in Matthew 5.45, it rains on the just and the unjust. But again, when bad things happen, so often we, we ask, well, why me? And I guess we really ought to ask, why not me? If we're on the mountaintop, do we stop and ask, why me? Why am I getting this blessing instead of someone else? Well, we're in the valley. It's not about what I've done or what you've done. It's just hard things happen. Bad things happen to all of us. And I, I've, I, I've, that, that's a question that, that uh, we've dealt with for a long time. Why do bad things happen? And there are so many reasons that people try to give. And, and I guess the simplest that I try to give is because this is earth. This isn't heaven. This is earth. And as long as we're on earth, bad things are going to happen. But there will be a day when we're in heaven. There will be a day when no more will rule. No more pain. No more crying. No more sickness. No more death. No more valleys. But while we're on earth, valleys are going to happen. Here's the next thing. Valleys are temporary. They, they don't go on forever. There's an end to them. Sometimes it seems like the valley is going to last forever, but it doesn't. Several years ago when our kids were little, I think my daughter was uh, seven, then my son was five, my next son was two. Uh, we were on vacation out in Colorado, and we were in Colorado Springs, and we wanted to go to the Royal Gorge. And we waited a little bit too late. We, we wanted to get there before dark, obviously, but we got away a little bit later than I'd hoped, and I was in a hurry. I'm driving the minivan, and it dawns on me, I just missed the exit that we were supposed to take. 
And the next exit on the highway is way up there. And I thought, we're going to have to drive way up there, turn around, come back, and we're going to be late. And my wife, and, and I feel like I need to kind of hit the pause button here and tell you what, explain some things for, for some of you maybe. Uh, she reached in the glove box and she pulled out, what well, it's called a map, okay? It, it's this big piece of paper that you unfold and it's got all the roads. It was before GPS, you know, that's the way we found our way around. And she's looking at the map and she said, hey, we don't have to go all the way down there. There's a, a, a exit coming up and it looks like a shortcut. Because on the map, it was only about this long. And it was straight. And it was called Phantom Canyon. And so we took the exit and we started going down Phantom Canyon. And it, it, I think it's 26 miles, mostly unpaved road, gravel road, dirt road. It goes through mining camps. You're going up and down and around so you can't go fast. And, and you go around one curve and you couldn't see the mountaintop. You go around the next curve, you couldn't see the bottom of the valley. And I'm, I'm pretty sure for the first half of that trip, the first half of that detour, the first half of that shortcut, that I had what my wife and my kids refer to as the look. I don't know if that means anything to your families, but they say I have the look. And then I started noticing, this is pretty. This is amazing, these old mining camps. And, and, and so we'd get out and we'd pose for some pictures. And I wish I could find this picture. It's in an album somewhere. I would show it to you. There's a picture of me, uh, the back of me and the back of my five-year-old son. And if you look close enough, you'll notice that I'm holding his collar. We're standing at the edge of a cliff. And all you see is his bare bottom because he is peeing off the cliff. <laughs> and if you look closer... Through my legs, you see our two-year-old, and I'm holding on to him, and he's got a bare bottom, and they're both peeing off the cliff. It was a Kodak moment. And we had a blast. But you know, that first part, all I was thinking was, we're going to be late, and what we're missing. And I almost missed what could have happened. In the scope of the entire vacation, being inconvenienced wasn't really worth getting upset over. I think it's that way in life. You know, we, we, we're going to go through tough times. But we need to look and see that there's blessings in those tough times as well. And whatever you go through in this life, it's not going to last forever. Anything in this life is temporary, but heaven is eternal. Here's the next lesson. Valleys are purposeful. God will never waste a valley there is good that comes out of every hurt. There is good that comes out of every disappointment. There is good that comes out of every defeat and every discouragement. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been, according, who have been called according to his purpose. God doesn't just work in some things. He works in all things. He works in everything. Okay, let me hit the pause button again. I'm going to say everything, and then you, re you repeat it after me. Everything. Again, everything. everything. One more time, everything. everything. God works in everything. God works in all things to bring good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, if that is God's promise to us, and it is, then we have two choices we can make. We can say, God, I trust you, and what's going on in my life right now is tough. It doesn't mean I have to like it, but again, I trust you, so please reveal to me the good that's going to come from this. Or we can wring our hands and cry, God, this isn't fair. Why does this kind of stuff have to, have to happen to me? We, we can respond in faith, trusting that our shepherd will lead us through the valley, or we can respond in fear and get stuck in the valley. But now listen to me. Our faith gets developed in the valley. Our faith gets developed in the valley. I, I have to be honest with you. I love the mountaintop experiences. I, I'd like to have more mountaintop experiences. But when I look back at my life, it's been in the valleys I've grown the most. It, it's been in the tough times that I've learned to trust God. It's been when things are falling apart all around me that I've really turned and trusted in God. It's when I can't take another step 
then I've reached out and taken the hand of the Father and walked with Him. It's been when I've stood in a cemetery with a broken heart that the hope of eternal life, the promise of eternal life has become even more real and more encouraging. A few years ago, my, my wife woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning and she said, I, I think I'm having a heart attack. And it wasn't just a feeling she was having. She had Googled women's heart attack symptoms. And she had all but one. And I knew that she was feeling really scared and bad when I said, well, do you want me to drive you to the hospital or do you want me to call 911? And she said, I think you better call 911. So I did. And, uh, and one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was have that ambulance door shut and see it drive away and then I went in locked the doors shut off lights and hopped in the car and went to the hospital they did all the tests it wasn't a heart attack a few months later the same thing happened and I drove her to the hospital they did all the tests it wasn't a heart attack we went to the doctor and he said I, I think it looks like it's probably your gallbladder and you need to have your gallbladder out so we went in and they they scheduled surgery she was taken back to surgery the the a uh, nurse practitioner came out and said, hey, everything's done. And then she described the, the gallbladder. I think this is a medical term. She said, that thing was ginormous. <laughs> I think ginormous is a medical term. And said, she's, she's not feeling very good. Well, I went back. And we've been married. It'll be 44 years in December. So I know my wife pretty well. And I knew that she would be disappointed if I didn't get some videos of her when she's coming out of anesthesia saying funny, goofy things. And then I knew that she would really be disappoint, disappointed if I didn't post that on Facebook. And so I, I got my phone out and I turned it on video. I walked in that recovery room to capture the goofy things that she was going to say. And then I put it away because she was hurting. She was in pain. So I walked over and, and I, I just took her hand. And when I took her hand, she squeezed my hand. And it's like she relaxed a little bit. So I stood there for a while. And then I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to go get a chair or something. And I started to let go. And she grabbed my hand. And as long as I was holding her hand, she seemed to be okay. But when I let go, she would get agitated. So I, I reached back with my foot and I pulled a stool over by the bed. And I sat down on the stool put my head down on, on the bed, just held her hand. And what happened next, I can only describe as being a holy moment. Because all these pictures started going through my mind. It was like George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life. I was able to go back and I remember seeing this cute freshman on the campus of Lincoln Christian College across this crowded room and thought, I've got to get to know her. And then fall in love with her, getting married, having kids, sharing life together. And there were so many good, happy memories. But there were some painful ones too. There were mountaintops, but there were valleys. And as I sat there holding her hand, and I was able to see how all of these things had come together. The good, the bad, the hard, the mountaintops and valleys had brought us to where we were. And it was a holy moment. My friends, God will use the valleys we go through to help build and shape our character so that we will have more of the character of Christ in us. Now listen to me. God doesn't cause the bad things to happen in our lives. He's a good God, not an evil God. But he can take the bad things we face and turn them around for good. He can take us through the valleys so that our faith is bigger and better when we get to the other side. So what do we do? What do we do when we find ourselves in a valley? Well, let's look at what David says. The first is refuse to give up. Refuse to give up. David writes, I will not be afraid. I will fear no evil. And if we break this verse down a little bit, David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I think that's important there. He's going through a valley, but he says, even though I walk through the valley, that word walk is important. He doesn't say, I I'm going to run. He's not out of control. He's not panicking. He is walking. He is deliberate. He's not trying to run ahead of God or away from God. He is trying to walk 
with God. And, and we tend to make mistakes when we panic. When we react, we run, we, we, we sometimes get off track or go the wrong direction. But David says, I walk. I'm steady. I'm taking deliberate steps in the right direction. And he goes on, he says, I will not be afraid. Again, notice he doesn't say, I'm not afraid. He says, I will fear no evil. I will not be afraid. He is making up his mind before he gets to the valley not to be afraid. He was choosing in advance not to be afraid. We have a choice to make how we're going to handle the disappointments in life. I I want you to listen to me today because this is where it might get a little uncomfortable. Okay, I want to warn you. This is where it might get a little uncomfortable. If you are discouraged today, you are choosing to be discouraged. If you're afraid today, you're choosing to be afraid. If if you have a negative attitude today, you're choosing to have a negative attitude. Let me add another one. If you're upset with me right now because I've called you out, you're choosing to be upset with me right now. And I'm not telling you those things because I want to kick you when you're down. I'm not trying to be hard-hearted or uncaring, but we have a choice to make. And David says, I choose to trust God. I choose to walk. I I choose to have faith. The truth of the matter is you and I choose how we're going to respond to the valley. And we can choose to not be afraid and walk through the valley knowing that our shepherd is with us. Or we can choose to be afraid and become discouraged and bitter. We can choose to focus on our problem. Or we can choose to focus on God's protection. Here's the second thing. Remember that God is with us. David says, for you are with me. You're with me. You are with me every moment of the day. Sometimes I think we convince ourselves that that God is with us on the mountaintop, maybe because we feel him with us on the mountaintop. But somehow we think that when we're in the valley, God has left us. And God doesn't leave us. God promises that he is always with us. Look at something that takes place in in the psalm at this point. In the the first three verses, David is referring to God in the third person. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But notice what happens in verse 4 when David starts talking about the dark valley. There's a switch to the first person. And instead of talking about God, he starts talking to God. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's almost like David is saying, hey, when I get to the valley, I don't want to know about God. I want to know God. I don't want to talk about God. I want to talk to God. And I think David wants us to know and remember that God is always with us. When you're in that valley, God isn't up in heaven looking down thinking, oh, I hope he makes it or I hope she makes it. He's in the valley with us. He's there with us. He's walking with us and he expects us to walk he expects us to keep going and he expects us to trust him so remember that God is with you keep walking with him and here's the last thing rely on God's presence and protection the last part of verse 4 your rod and your staff they comfort me the rod and staff were the two basic tools that a shepherd would have. The rod was this, this kind of like a club. It had a knot at the end. they would say it was about two foot long. It could be used as a club to, to hit and protect a sheep if a, a wolf or an animal were coming in. Or it could be thrown. It was more of a weapon to protect. And the staff, you know what a staff, the long, uh, long stick with a crook. And that, that was used to lead. That was used to, to, to get back on the path. Or, or if a lamb had fallen off, to hook it and pull it back. And the picture that we get is when we're going through a valley, God, our shepherd, is there to defend us. He will fight for us. He will protect us. And he's also there to lead us and to keep us on the right path. He's our leader and guide 
and he's our protector. You probably remember the Old Testament account of Moses leading the Israelites out of slavery. They, they were in the desert on their way to the promised land, and I've got to believe they were on top of the world. I mean, they'd been slaves for 400 years, and now they are finally going to that promised land that, that their ancestors had told them that God had promised. They, they had to be excited. I don't know what they were singing, but they were probably singing, you know, Kumbaya, our God is mighty to save, or something like that. They, they were great. And then they come to the, the sea in front of them and mountains beside them and Pharaoh's army behind them. Talk about a valley. And immediately... They went from singing and being happy to turning on Moses and saying, why did you lead us here? Weren't there enough graves in Egypt for us to be buried? We had to come out here to die. And I love the way the psalmist describes what happened next. In Psalm 77, in the New Living Translation, it goes like this. Your road led, your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. You led your people along the road like a flock of sheep with Moses and Aaron as their shepherds. I love that verse because it's that shepherd view that God is our shepherd, but Moses and Aaron were, were the shepherds. But I love this phrase, a pathway no one knew was there. All they saw were the mountains beside them, the army behind them, and the water in front of them. But there was a pathway. They couldn't see it, but God could. And he parted the water, and they walked through on dry ground. A pathway no one knew was there. I don't know where you are today. Maybe you feel trapped. Maybe you're in a valley. Perhaps you don't see a way out. Maybe you're feeling hopeless. What do you do? You keep on holding on. Keep holding on to God's promise Keep holding on to God's power. Keep holding on to God's presence. Keep holding on to God's protection. And know that God is with you. He's always with you. I love this saying of Corin Ten Boom, this quote, Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. We may not know what's waiting for us up here, but we have this lifetime of knowing that God has been there. And we trust that God in the past, we need to trust God in the future. Psalm 23 gives us hope for today and tomorrow. Hope for this life, because God is with us. He walks with us. He's our shepherd. But Psalm 23 ends with one of the most beautiful lines in the Bible as a reminder of our hope. Not hope to simply make it through a valley. Not hope to simply make it through a life. But hope that will last for eternity when the psalmist writes, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Would you repeat that word after me? Forever. Again, forever. One more time, forever. Because in heaven, it will be a place of no more. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more tears, no more sickness, no more death. But we will live in the presence of God in perfection forever. So if you're going through a valley, hold on. God is with you. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. I thank you, God, that you are, are with us, that we have good times that we can celebrate. But God, sometimes life is hard. And so I thank you for always being there with us and for us. And I pray for those here today who might be in the middle of a, a dark valley. God, I pray that they would, uh, they would turn to you, not away from you. I pray that they would trust you. God, I pray that all of us would, would look to you and decide that uh, we're not going to be afraid. Because you're our shepherd. So God, help us to hold on. And help us to be faithful because we know that you are faithful. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We, uh, my family and I just uh, finished harvest yesterday, so you probably think we're going to give you a harvest 
communion? Well, I'm not. <clears throat> Actually, to be honest, I'm totally unprepared. And uh, trying one of those uh, moments where I'm going to trust God with this one. So here we go. This morning, actually for the year, I was like, I'm going to just read scripture from the beginning. I'm on Exodus, which is the second book. Okay, so not perfect by any means. But anyway, today's, uh, when I was reading, I'm in Exodus chapter 12, which is uh, the story of the Passover. It's the chapter just before what David was talking about when they're getting to the uh, on their way out. This is the Passover portion. And so, uh, before I get into that, I would just want you to imagine for a second that uh, Preacher Dave, he goes, I'm going to go on vacation because this is a tough message. I'm going to have Up Church come, and he's going to say, hey guys, I've been praying. Uh, there's a problem. I need you all to go get a sheep or a, a firstborn lamb, and we're, gonna, we're all going to, uh, you know, execute it. And take the blood, and we're going to paint our doorposts with this blood, and you're just going to have to trust me with this, okay? That would be kind of awkward, right? <laughs> but you know what? I've been following God for a little bit, and God asks us to do stuff, and most of the time, it's a very unusual task that's very not normal or atypical, something I'm not used to doing. It's very unexpected. Uh, it's not scheduled. It's not something I had planned. And most of the time, I have no understanding of why. It's just one of those things. Uh, he wants us to trust him with. And scripture is filled with stories like this. I'm sure if we had time, I'm sure you all have stories like that too. But uh, back to Exodus, I wanted to read this because it just jumped out to me this morning. There's several verses, and it skips around a little bit, but hang on with me. Verse 12, on that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn with both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt I am the Lord. The blood, the doorpost, will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Then that was repeated again in verse for the most part, it's this idea of generation to generation. We're going to keep doing this, you guys. So on the verse 17, celebrate this festival of unleavened bread. Those little crackers we're about to eat here soon. Because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Verse 24, obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land, the Lord will give you, as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what's this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it's the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt, spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Verse 40. Now the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. How old is America? Like not even 250? 430 years they were in slavery. At the end of the 430 to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt because the Lord kept vigil that night and brought them out of Egypt on this night. All the Israelites are to keep vigil to honor the Lord for the generations to come. When Jesus came to Jerusalem, and did the Last Supper, this is what they were remembering. It was a long time from Exodus to that. And we're still remembering that today. In that Jesus was the lamb that was slain. He was the blood that was shed. 
and he died for you and he died for me, but he's also raised to life. He's a good shepherd, trying to, and I, I need this more than anybody, with the shepherd's hook that David was talking about, he's like, come on, Dan, we're going to go this way. And so, uh, love that we can share this moment together in communion and uh, remember him, and for not our just our generation, but for the next one too. Let's pray. God, you're good, and uh, boy, I need this reminder more than anybody just not to overthink it and just to trust you that uh, uh, you got this, and I'm just grateful for this church in this time that we can share together and remember uh, all the stories and uh, help us to trust you more each and every day as we share in communion together. In Jesus' name.